This lecture will introduce the Quine-McCluskey algorithm for simplifying combinational logic. Up until this point, we've seen Boolean algebra and Carnot maps. Those are two different simplification techniques. Boolean algebra is pretty nice for us because it allows us to apply a lot of theorems and laws, really just to try to take a more complex expression and simplify it on down to a minimal expression. But again, the problem is with that, we don't really know when we've gotten to the minimal solution. We could get something simplified, but there could be another way to simplify it. Maybe we forgot a theorem or there was just something we we didn't realize we could reduce. We also have seen Carnot maps, or K-maps for short. That's a way to graphically reduce things. It did get us toward a minimal solution, but as you saw with the five variable K-maps, it gets pretty cumbersome if you have a lot of variables, and really going beyond five variables is pretty much not feasible with this particular method. You don't really want to go much more than about four variables with Carnot maps for simplification. So the beauty of the Quine-McCluskey algorithm, or QM approach, is that it allows us to use a systematic technique. Those of you that are very familiar with programming, everybody, of course, has taken at least one programming class before you've gotten to this course. But uh, particularly those of you on the computer science side of the house might really appreciate this algorithmic approach to reducing combinational logic. And basically what happens here is you're going to be able to reach a minimal solution for any system of combinational logic up through n variables. So this works for any number of variables that you may have. The nice thing about this is you can actually write a program to do this for you, so you don't have to simply do it by hand. But in this class, we will be showcasing this work by hand and getting to a minimal solution that way. So let's talk about this algorithm and how it works. The first thing you want to do is start with a min-term expansion for your function. So that's why we have emphasized the notion of min-term expansions gone from truth tables into min-term expansions. And the basic approach is you're going to eliminate as many terms from that by really just combining things in the form that you see here. So if you have an xy or xy prime, you remember that that can be reduced to simply x. And that's what we're going to do one layer at a time. And notice that x here can be simply a literal term, so an a, a b, a c, whatever your inputs happen to be. Or that could be a product or something like that, where you have like a and b and c might be your x. And in this case, we're going to get all the way to a list of all of the prime implicants. And as you remember from the Carnot map exercise, we may or may not use all of the prime implicants. Remember, we have this notion of essential prime implicants, which we have to use. We're going to generate down to that list, and then we're going to choose from the remaining prime implicants the ones that we want to use to get full coverage. So we're going to use a prime implicant chart to do that. We'll showcase that in a few slides once we get to that point of identifying all the prime implicants. So the first part of the algorithm is listing out all our min terms. And from there, we're going to reduce down to our list of prime implicants. Then from there, we're going to use a prime implicant chart to help us select which of the prime implicants we're going to use in our final solution for the function. So how do we determine these prime implicants? Well, again, you start with the min terms. And you'll notice that min terms can be combined if they differ in one and only one variable. This was the exact same thing that we saw in the Carnot maps. If you're talking about adjacent cells in the Carnot maps, they differed by only one variable. So when we were talking about which ones on a K-map could be looped together, we only chose those ones that were adjacent and differing by only one variable. The same thing is happening here. And effectively, what you're going to be doing is showcasing going from individual groups of one min term to groups of two, showcasing all possibilities of min terms that can be looped together into groups of two. Then you're going to go into taking those groups of two and seeing if any of them can be looped into groups of four and progressing until you can make no larger groups with any of your groupings in the previous uh, iteration. So here's an example here. If you started with, let's say, a min term expansion that had a, b prime, c, d prime, or a b prime c d, what you would notice is that these two terms happen to have an a b prime c in common. They differ only in their d term, and we can thus combine that into a b prime c. 
Within the Quine McCluskey algorithm, what we're going to do is write that out in terms of ones and zeros. So everywhere we have the true variable, that is in this case A or C, as you see here, we're going to have ones, and wherever we have the complement of a variable or the prime term, we're going to put zeros. And what we're going to look at is where we have terms that only differ in one and only one bit. So if we look at these two terms, this one happens to have two ones, this one happens to have three ones, the only bit that is different is the least significant bit in both cases. And what we will do is simplify that, leaving the bits that are in common, and just putting a single dash where those bits happen to differ. So we're going to put this dash here. What we're going to do when we start out is list all the min terms in a column, but we're not going to list them in numerical order. We're going to list them based on how many ones they have. So using this particular algorithm, you'll only be able to combine min terms together if they have a difference of exactly one one. So you might have min terms that have zero ones and combine them with min terms that have one one, but you could not have something that had zero ones and combine it with something with three ones because by definition it would have to be differing by more than one bit in that case. And so what we're going to do is get all those groups together. So your 0, 1's group, your 1, 1's group, your 2, 1's group, etc. And then you're going to look group by group, comparing all the terms from one group to the adjacent groups and seeing which ones can be combined. Then you're going to check off those min terms. Since they can be combined, they are therefore not going to be prime implicants and can be checked off the list. And then you're going to write down what that combination would be in the next column. And once you do that, you know that the value in the previous column can be eliminated because it is not a prime implicant. You're going to keep doing that until you get all the way to a column where you can no longer make any combination. So perhaps you have groups of four, but you don't have a group of eight. You would have to stop at the third column. And we're going to see an example of that as we go on through. So Let's suppose we had this particular function here. We're writing this as a min term expansion. And the first thing we want to do is think about the binary value that represents all of these terms. So binary for 0, binary for 1, etc., all the way up through 14. And we're going to look at those binary values and see how many 1's each of those have. So for example, to represent all of these, we're going to have to have 4 bits. So 0 is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, obviously. So that's going to be in our 0, 1 group. That's going to be the only min term that ever shows up in a 0, 1 group. 1 is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. So that's going to be in your 1, 1 group. 2 is going to be 0, 0, 1, 0. That's also going to be in your 1, 0 group, or 1, 1 group, rather. And then your 5 is going to be 0, 1, 0, 1. Since that has two ones, that's going to be in your 2 group. 8 will also be in your 1, 1 group because it's going to be 1, 0, 0, 0. So let's see how this would play out. Here are our groups. Notice that group 0 only has 0. That's all that fits there. 1, 2, and 8 have a single 1. So they're in group 1. 5, 6, 9, and 10 show up here in group 2, and then 7 and 14 show up down in group 3. And now what we're going to do is we're going to start comparing group 0 terms to group 1 terms and see which of them in combination would differ by only one bit. So for example here, 0 and 1 only have a difference on that rightmost bit, so they could be combined to form 0, 0, 0, dash. So let's see this played out. We start with this, and we do a comparison between the 0 group and the 1 group, and here we go. We notice that 0 and 1 can be combined, so we're going to check those off. And then in column 2, we're going to list which min terms we're combining to make this new term. So we've combined 0 and 1 into a 0, 0, 0 dash. So the dash represents the one place where we saw a bit that was different. And then we can proceed. We can compare 0 to 2 and realize that it can combine, as you see there. We can compare 0 to 8. So now we've compared all of our 0, 1 our zero elements to our one elements, and we figured out which of those can combine. And in fact, what you're going to notice is that zero will automatically combine with all of your group one elements. Now what we're going to do is compare group one to group two. So we can look and compare one to five, and what you notice is the only bit that is different is that second bit there. So one and five can show up. We already checked off one, but now we're going to check off five. 
And so now we get a 0 dash 0 1, indicating that the only bit that was different was bit 2. We can compare 1 to 6. That's not going to move over into the second column because they're going to have three bits that are different. So we only want things that have one bit different. Compare 1 to 9. And in fact, what you see here, the only bit that's different is going to be that leading bit the leftmost bit. So 1 and 9 can combine. We can check off 9. Then compare 1 to 10. And 1 and 10 differ by more than one bit. So that's not going to be a good comparison. Now we're going to go back and compare 2 to all of the elements in group 2. So if we look, 2 and 5 can't combine. 2 and 6, in fact, can. And you see that there. Then we go 2 and 9. No, they differ by too many bits. And then 2 and 10. As you see, 2 and 10 differ only by their leftmost bit. So in fact, 2 and 10 will show up here. And finally, the 1 to 2 comparison. We look at 8. And 8 cannot combine with 5, cannot combine with 6. It can combine with 9. And it also can combine with 10. So we get those there. Now we're done comparing our group 1 and our group 2 terms. Finally, we're going to compare group 2 to group 3. So within group 2 to 3, you notice that 5 and 7 can combine, as well as 6 and 7. And 9 cannot be combined with 7. We also notice that 10 cannot be combined with 7. And then we keep on going. We notice that 6 and 14 and also 10 and 14 can be combined. So now we've done all of our column 1 comparisons. And we've got some elements over here in column 2. And we're going to compare these groups now. So what we end up having here in column 2, we have our 0 1s group up at the top. Now we have our 1 1s group in the middle. And down here at the bottom, we have our 2 1s group. And again, we're going to do group by group comparisons. Now, the other thing that we need to consider when we compare column two is that the dashes have to align. So when we're thinking about whether an element in this group up here could align with an element in the middle group, we have to make sure the dash is aligned. So when we make that comparison, the dashes must align. And the remaining terms that are non-dashes must differ by only one bit. So for example, if we look at our 0, 1 term, which is 0, 0, 0 dash, we have to look down here and see which of these terms has a dash in the rightmost position. The only one we have is 8, 9. And in fact, if we look at that, there is only a difference in that first bit, the leftmost bit. So we can, in fact, combine that. And that's going to make dash, 0, 0, dash. And we can go ahead and check off our 0, 1 and our 8, 9. Then we realize we're done comparing 0, 1. That's the only thing down here that has a dash in here is the 8, 9. Now we go to 0, 2. And we need to look for anything that has a dash in the second column. And what we notice, or second from the right column, what we notice is that it can be combined with 8 and 10. So 0, 2, 8, and 10. We check off the 0, 2, check off the 8, 10. And that's the only thing in the second group that has a dash there. Now we look for 0, 8. And we notice that 0, 8 can be combined with 1 and 9. So we can put that there. But we're going to go ahead and scratch that off. Why? Because this is the exact same term that resulted up here with 0, 1, 8, and 9. We still want to check it off over here. But we don't need anything that's already the same as what we already had over there. So 0, 8, 1, and 9 is effectively a new group, but it's redundant with, with what we already had up there. We're going to go ahead and make sure that is checked off, but we don't need that anymore. Likewise, we could form a grouping between 0, 8 and 2, 10. So 0, 8, if we look down here, it can also combine with 2, 10. We'll go ahead and check off 2, 10. But again, this is the same as this grouping we had in the second row right there. That's all the comparison between the top and the middle group. Now let's look at our middle group relative to the bottom group. So in the bottom group, we've got one term that has a dash in the second column, but it's got too many bits that are different. In this one, in the bottom, we've got 614 has a dash in the same place as 19, but those can't be combined because they differ by too many bits. In terms of the second column here, 26 can be combined. Let's see, looking down at... 10, 14. We can combine there, so we make dash, dash, 1, 0. And then down here, 2, 10, a leading dash. 
that can be combined with 614, but what you notice, that's the same exact thing we just saw, but we'll still check it off. And then 8 and 9, looking down, the dash lines up with 6, 7, but there's too many 1s different. And then finally 8, 10, that would line up with 5, 7, but there's too many bits different there. And so now we are done formulating the third column. And so from there, we would look at the third column and see if we had anything that had dashes in the same place. And amongst these three terms that we see here, there happens to be nothing that has dashes in the same exact spot. So once we get to column three, we are in fact finished. And now what we want to do is identify all of the terms that did not get checked off. So within column one, we did find a mate for all of those terms in there. So everything got checked off. That means if you were to plot this on a Carnot map, you would not have any prime implicants that were single groups of an individual one. You would always have at least groups of two. Then in column two, we didn't find a mate for one, five, five, seven, or six, seven. So we have three um, groups of two that turn into be prime implicants. And then over here in column three, we had those three terms and none of them got checked off. So we do have three prime implicants there. Now we're going to take this and we're going to put it in a prime implicant chart to see which of the six prime implicants we've identified are essential. So what we're going to do is take all those terms. Those are the only terms that could appear in our final expression. So those are the only ones that we're going to consider. And if we didn't try to figure out which ones were essential and if any of them were redundant, if we stopped right there, we could get this final expression here. How do we get that? Well, if we go back to what we had selected, 0 dash 0 1, if we were to express that in terms of A, B, C, and D, wherever you have a 0, that's going to be the prime of your variable. Wherever you have a dash, that variable is not going to show up at all. And wherever you have a 1, the true non-prime is going to show up. So the 1, 5 term here would be A prime because you have a 0. B would not show up. C prime, D. So it would be A prime, C prime, D. Likewise, 5, 7 would be A prime, B, D. Okay, so if we were just to take all those, we would end up with this expression here. But I think we can do a little bit better. And what we're going to do is use a prime implicant chart to figure out how we can minimize the logic further. So what we're going to do is list across the top all of the min terms that we need coverage for. And down the left-hand column, we're going to list out all of the groupings that we determined were prime implicants. And in some cases, those prime implicants cover four terms. In some cases, they only cover two terms. And what we're going to do is we're going to put x's in the column corresponding to where they have coverage from these prime implicants. So for example, B prime, C prime covers 0, 1, 8, and 9. So we would expect an X to show up here in the 0 column, the 1 column, the 8 column, and the 9 column. So let's just go min term by min term. So coverage for 0, we see that show up in 0, 1, 8, 9. We see that show up in 0, 2, 8, 9. So in terms of that column, we're going to put those two X's there. In terms of min term 1, what we're going to see is that shows up in our B prime, C prime. That also shows up in our A prime, C prime, D. So we're going to have X's there. In terms of min term 2, that's going to show up in B prime, D prime, also C, D prime. In terms of min term 5, that's going to show up in A prime, C prime, D, and also A prime, B, D. In terms of min term 6, we're going to see that showing up in C, D prime, as well as A prime, B, C. Min term 7, we're going to see that show up in the bottom two uh, terms there, A prime, B, D, and also A prime, B, C. Then min term 8 is going to show up in our top two groups there. Min term 9 is going to show up in the top group. Now one thing that's interesting here, min term 9 only shows up in B prime, C prime. And we're going to put a circle around any x that is the lone x in a column. That means that this min term is essential because it's the only uh, 
or this, sorry, not min term, but this prime implicant is essential because it is the only prime implicant that is covering 9. None of these other prime implicants give us coverage, so that means we must include B prime, C prime in our final logic. Going forward, looking at 10, we see that it's covered by B prime, D prime, and also C, D prime. And then finally, 14 is only showing up in C, D prime. So again, we found another essential prime implicant, C, D prime, which must show up in our final solution. Now what we can do is take away, um, based on what the essential prime implicants were that we found, we can start including those and we can cross out all of the min terms that we know we have coverage for by using those essential prime implicants. Um, once we pull those out, we're going to look at what min terms still need to be covered and we're going to have to figure out which non-essential prime implicants allow us to pick those. So if we start with our chart again, we know that we have to use B prime, C prime. So we're going to go ahead and cross that out and because we need that to cover 9, we automatically get coverage for 8, 1, and 0. So we don't have to worry about covering 0, 1, 8, or 9. Those are all covered by an essential prime implicant. Likewise, we needed the C, D prime term to cover 14. When we do that, we get 2, 6, and 10 also covered. So if we look at the chart, just based on pulling out these two essential prime implicants, we now are guaranteed coverage for 0, 1, 2, 6, 8, 9, 10, and 14. So the only terms that we don't yet have coverage for in terms of our original min terms are 5 and 7. And so based upon that, we realize that we need to figure out some coverage from our non-essential prime implicants that give us coverage there. So what we started out with we know we need these two terms, those are our essential prime implicants, and the question is, well, what else do we put with them so that we're ensuring that we are covering 5 and 7? Okay, one other thing that you might notice is that your B prime, D prime term, all of these terms got crossed out. So B prime, D prime gives us no benefit once we already include the essential prime implicants here. We can effectively eliminate the need for this prime implicant, B prime, D prime, and in fact the consensus theorem would showcase that that would be eliminated anyway because we're including B prime, C prime, and C, D prime. Um, we know since we have the C prime and the C right here, the product of what's multiplied by those things, the B prime, D prime, is going to be the consensus term and can be eliminated. So how do we cover 5 and 7? Well, if you happen to notice right here, we just happen to have a group that is covered for 5 and 7, A prime, B, D. So we'll go ahead and include that, add that into our function, and that will be our final solution. So here's another simple example. Let's suppose we had this, just going to be a little three variable problem. What you might want to do is pause the video, see if you can work through uh, making the second column on your own. And we're back. So now what we'll do is walk through this solution. We've got to compare our zero group to our one group. And what you see is that both of those do in fact combine. So we get a zero one, which is going to give you zero zero dash and a zero two right there. Then we're going to go ahead and compare our 1, 1 group to our 2, 1 group. And you see the combination that could happen here and also there. Then we're going to compare our 2, 1 group to our 3, 1 group. We get this combination right here. Now if we try to do a comparison between groups here, we'll notice 0, 1 can't combine with anything because there's not a dash in the right column of any other term. 0, 2, the only place that has a dash in the same spot is 5, 7, but we got a 0, 0 here and a 1, 1 there. Those can't be combined. And then if you try to combine 1, 5 and 2, 6 right there, the dash is aligned, but we've got two bits of difference amongst those expressions over there. So we can't go even to a column 3 in this particular example. Oh, sorry, I forgot about the 6, 7 term. But again, same problem here. If we try to compare 0, 1, um, 6, 7 is not going to combine. So now if we put this in the prime implicant chart, what you notice is that every min term has two terms that cover it. So there's no essential prime implicants in this example at all. And this becomes somewhat cyclic. So what you could do is pick a min term to be covered, 
go ahead and pick this term for example let's say we want to use the zero one which would be a prime b prime then you're automatically going to get coverage uh, for zero and one down here and then you just kind of go through picking other terms really the solution the simplest possible solution is found through trial and error you would just pick a combination of variables and see which one got you to the minimal solution in some cases in this case for example we found full coverage with a prime b prime b c prime and a c but there's bound to be a better way we want to make sure that there is an algorithmic way a consistent way in order to pick a coverage for our logic that is as minimized as possible so here's another way we could do this with a second trial we could go through and pick starting out with uh, p2 here which would be a prime c prime that would give us coverage for zero and two so we can automatically say hey we got zero we got two so we don't need to worry about getting coverage for that and eventually you could get on down to full coverage this gets us to the point of talking about Petrick's method. So Petrick's method is a way, once you've already figured out what your essential prime implicants are and realize that you need those in your final function, this is a way for us to choose from the non-essential prime implicants to get full coverage for the min terms that are not covered by those essential prime implicants. So what we're going to do is label all of the prime implicants that remain, the prime implicants that are determined to not be essential, and we're going to start looking at those and figuring out which of those we need in order to have coverage for all of our min terms. And we're going to create a combined expression. So here is an example. Um, we have seen this chart on the previous slide. Let's see how we could apply Petrick's method. So uh, we've gone on and labeled P1 through P6 for all of our prime implicants. We realize none of those were essential. And so what we can say is that in order to get coverage for zero, we need to choose P1 or P2. So we can put that down there. In order to get coverage for one, we know we need P1 or P3. So we must choose P1 or P2 and we must choose P1 or P3. Now we look at what we need to cover 2, and we know we need to choose either P2 or P4. We have to have coverage for all those other terms, so now we have to add in P2 or P4, and we can continue this on down the, run, on down the line. So for 5, we know we need to choose P3 or P5. For 6, we need to choose P4 or P6. And for 7, we need to choose either P5 or P6. Now we need all of those in combination. It could be that, let's say for example we picked P1 here, that would satisfy both of these first two expressions, so that would simplify. But if we happen to choose P2 here, then we're also going to need to choose either P1 or P3. What we can do once we have this expression written out is we can use the distributive property to look at what the minimal combination is of terms that allows us to express full coverage for all of our min terms that we need to cover. So what we can do is start multiplying things out and simplify using this Boolean algebra theorem. So for example, you could do the FOIL method here and you would end up with a P1 or P2 and P3. So here's what we're going to do. Notice we started out with this expression. We're going to combine these two terms. So when we do that, multiply it out, simplify redundant terms, what you end up here is with what's underlined in green. When you combine P2 or P4 with P4 or P6, you end up with what's underlined in blue. And then when you combine these two terms underlined in red, you end up with this. What I'm doing here and why I'm choosing to make those combinations is I'm trying to simplify my coverage as much as possible. So I didn't just go with nearest neighbor because I didn't find any common terms. If I were to just combine let's say this one that was underlined in blue, this one that was underlined in red, I don't have any common terms, so I'm going to end up with a really long expression. But by skipping over and combining here, you notice that P4 satisfies both of them, so that's why we get a simple P4 or P2 and P6. Likewise over here, the red underlined terms both share a P5, so P5 would satisfy both of those, or you have to get P3 and P6. And so now, we're going to take these three terms, 
Go ahead and apply the distributive property. In fact, we're just going to leave the red underlined one alone. Distribute the green and the blue together, and you get this monstrosity. Now you're going to take this and distribute all these terms together. At the end of the day, once you multiply all these terms out, you get this really long expression. So it's unfortunately going through a lot of algebra here. And what we want to do is we want to pick any of these combinations because any of these groupings will give us coverage for all of our min terms. And what we want to do is think, well, which one would be the simplest to choose? Now you notice amongst all these combinations, you've got some that require four min or four different uh, combinations. P1, P2, P5, and P6. You need all four of those. Some of them only require three. So you got P1, P4, P5, or P2, P3, P6. It's always better to choose the one that has the fewest terms in it. So if we were to get this into sum of products form using the terms that correspond to P1, P4, P5, what we would want is to pick either P1, P4, P5, or P2, P3, P6, because that gives us the fewest prime implicants needed. So the minimal solution, what you're going to get out of Petrick's method, is going to have the fewest prime implicants, and within those prime implicants, the fewest literals. So if you were to actually go back and look, what is P1, what is P4, what is P5? If we were to go back and look, all of these have the same number of literals. They're all two literal terms, so that's a wash. But if you happen to have, let's say, P1 was a three-variable term, P2 was a four-variable term, then in that case, you would want to choose the one that had the fewest variables in it. In this case, all of them are equal, so we'll go ahead and just choose either P1, P4, P5, or P2, P3, P6. So here's a summary of the Quine-McCluskey algorithm with Patrick's method. What you want to do is start with your midterm expansion. Think about how all those numbers are written in binary. Look at how many ones are in each of those binary values and cluster each of those binary values according to the number of ones that you have. So you'll have your 0, 1 group, your 1, 1 group, etc. Then what you want to do is compare the adjacent groups. So compare your 0, 1 group to your 1, 1 group, compare your 1, 1 group to your 2, 1 group, etc. And look at what can be combined. You're going to place a dash in the one differing bit. All the other bits should be carried on over. You're going to keep repeating that process column by column until you've determined your prime implicants. And you're going to figure that out once you get to a column where no more terms can be combined. That's when you know you're done there. Then, once you've determined your prime implicants, those are going to be the terms that are not checked off in your chart, you're going to develop a prime implicant table or prime implicant chart. What you're going to do is write across the top all of the min terms you need coverage for. Then across the left-hand side, you're going to list out all of the prime implicants that were identified by the previous process. And you're going to see which of those prime implicants are essential by looking at each column and determining if there's only one x in any given column. If there is only one x, then you know you need to include that prime implicant, and so that prime implicant will be part of your final solution. Once you get there, after you've eliminated all of the min terms that still need coverage, um, or after you've eliminated all the min terms that are covered by the essential prime implicants, then you can look at the min terms that still need coverage, and you can look at the non-essential prime implicants and figure out a minimal solution to cover them using Petrick's method. We can also do this method with incompletely specified functions. Those are functions that involve don't cares on the outputs. And in that case, it's going to be very, very similar. You're going to include in that first process the don't cares exactly the same as the min terms in terms of combining and trying to make groups, which makes sense because you can combine the don't care terms with ones if they're helpful to you. So if we can make bigger and bigger groups, we're going to want to try to do that. But when we get to our prime implicant chart, we are not going to have to worry about coverage for those don't cares. We're not going to list those because we really don't care if we cover the don't care terms or not. That's why they're called don't cares. But we must cover our min terms. So here's an example. Let's suppose you had this function, which is going to involve min terms and don't cares. So we, you see the min terms listed there, but we don't care about 1, 10, and 15. So here we're going to list everything out in column 1. You'll notice that at this point we've treated the min terms exactly like the don't cares. We're going to proceed on through here, really just 
trying to figure out combinations. So what she determines 1 and 3 can be combined, 1 and 9, 2 and 3, 2 and 10, 3 and 7, 3 and 11, 9 and 11, 9 and 13, 10 and 11, 7 and 15. We're going to keep on going through that process just like we did before. And you're going to keep going now that you've got column 2 all finished. Compare the top group in column 2 to the middle group in column 2, looking at where the dashes align, looking at where the non-dash terms differ by only one bit. And you get another combination here. You get a redundant combination there, but we still check it off. You get 2, 3, 10, and 11. And you get a 3, 7, 11, 15. And you see that coming in a few different places. Um, some redundant terms with what you already have there. And a 9, 11, 13, 15 as well. And then you also see that 9, 13 can in fact combine with 11 and 15. So we in fact in this example do check off all of the elements in column 2. Now in column 3 we need to find terms that have dashes in all the same spots. You'll notice that none of these four terms do have dashes in all the same spots. So if we look at these columns, what you'll notice is that everything in column 1 got checked off, everything in column 2 got checked off, and in column 3, all four of those terms are prime implicants. So now, we're going to develop our prime implicant chart, and notice we're only going to include the min terms that we have. We're not going to include the don't cares. Now you'll notice some of these groupings may have some don't care terms in them. In that case, that just means even though we're combining four terms, we're just only going to put x's for the ones that happen to be min terms. So for example here, 1, 3, 9, and 11, you'll notice that 1 does not show up in that chart. That's because 1 is a don't care. So we're not going to put any x's in a 1 column. 3 is a min term, so we would put an x there. 9 is a min term, we would put an x there, and 11 is a min term, we would put that there. We can remind ourselves off to the left what those groupings happen to be. So in this case, this first term would end up being B prime D, this term would end up being B prime C, this would end up being C D, and this term here would be A D. So if we go on through, what we end up noticing is that we do have this coverage. And you can show that to your uh, choose that uh, for yourself. Just go ahead and look at that. What you notice is that 2 is only covered by this second term, so you would only end up with an x there, so that's why you have to choose b prime c prime. This becomes an essential prime implicant. cd, you'll notice that um, you get coverage for 11 from several other terms. You don't need coverage for 15, but this is the only term that covers 7, so that's going to be an essential prime implicant. And then you'll notice down here in terms of AD, 9 can be covered by a couple different things. 11 is in fact covered by all of them, but this is the only prime implicant we have that gives us coverage for 13, so that's also essential. You'll also notice that once you choose these three to be essential prime implicants, you've got coverage for all of your min terms. In fact, this top term doesn't give us anything that we don't already have. Um, so that term is not necessary in the final expression. Okay, this, this concludes our lecture on the Quine-McCluskey algorithm. Please come into class with any questions you might have about the algorithm.